Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, good morning, people out in cyberspace. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Good morning. This, I was, uh, I just re I realized when I was preparing this, this is my 13th time to, to be, <laughs> to be a uh, guest speaker. I know. And uh, uh, since I think the first one I did was 2015, so it's been, you know, that's over many years. But anyway, uh, and I'm happy to be here. I, I'm uh, very thankful for the opportunity, so thank you very much. Um, you know, 1111 is kind of a mystical number, supposedly, but so is 13. <laughs> I'm not sure 13 is a lucky number, so if sometime during my sermon the ground starts to swallow me up or something, don't, don't be surprised. Anyway, well, the title of the sermon is Everything, Everything Breathes, and... Um, Yeah, so uh, breathe with me, please. Yeah, just uh, you know, take a deep breath. Send me your positive vibes, especially since it's uh, thir sermon number 13. So anyway, so that song, uh, Live Your Life With Arms Wide Open, that's a great feeling and a, and a great message, a very refreshing message, I would say. Um, I would call this uh, a transcendental song in a lot of ways. I'm going to come back to that point. But hopefully some of you have gotten to live your Live your day with arms wide open today. Maybe you had a particularly good day. Um, the trick is trying to get it to work all the time, right, on a consistent basis. And that's really, the, that's really the game. Anyway, so it's kind of a transcendental song, a transcendental message, because the song is not so much about what's happening in the world as it is about what's happening in our own minds uh, and how we adapt to it and maybe our, uh, our subjective interpretation of it. Um, I've got some more transcendental lyrics for you. See if you know this one. Now, now chiefly is my natal hour, and only now my prime of life. <laughs> Anybody know who that is? No. That's, that's Thoreau. That's Thoreau. Good guess, though. He is, you, got, you got the transcendentalist, yeah. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was one of our own American uh, writers and uh, legends, uh, Thoreau there, um, talking about the importance of the moment, that everything really happens in the moment and the rest is an illusion. But, um, so you can see there's an American tradition. There's a very strong American tradition of, of inner light and looking for, for the inner light. Um, it's sort of our version our country's version, or our culture's version of the, um, uh, I guess you might call it the perennial philosophy. Um, now, some of you may have heard that term before, perennial philosophy, and you may associate it if you've, uh, there was a book by Aldous Huxley that came out right after World War II. I doubt any of you are old enough to have read, read it when it came out, but perhaps you've read it in reprint. Uh, maybe that's where you've heard perennial philosophy, where he kind of summarizes the peren perennial philosophy. Um, but that term actually first appears about the time of Martin Luther. Uh, Martin Luther, obviously the famous Protestant reformer, um, and of course enemy at the time, enemy of the Catholic Church because of his reforms. So the very first person to use the term uh, perennial philosophy, and the one that's responsible for its sticking kind of and, and being used up to this day, um, is this guy. This is August Stucco, and he was a, he was a Catholic priest. And he was strongly opposed to uh, Martin Luther's reforms. So what he did was, is he did this really in-depth study of cultures, um, classical cultures, Rome, Greece. He looked into um, tribal traditions. He looked, and, and what he wanted to do is build a case that you can find elements of Catholicism all, all through the world and in the past. And in doing so, he, he thought, he felt like he was proving the validity of the Catholic faith instead of the Protestant faith. Um, that's where the term comes from. He called it the perennial philosophy because he felt like it supported the, um, the, the Catholic Church. Anyway, that's, it's changed. Now it's, it's kind of this idea that if you look into all religions, or at least the mystical traditions in all religions, you find that the same kinds of ideas come up in every religion. It doesn't matter whether it's Christianity or Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism or in the, the tribal religions you get a lot of the same themes. And I'm not going to go over all of those. That would be a great college class. But just to summarize in the shortest possible sentence to summarize kind of what the perennial philosophy is, is everything is one. 
and you hear Tom hit on this a lot. He talks about uh, dualism and monism and all that kind of thing. But it's, it's, it's related to that. Everything is actually one thing. There is one thing in the universe that gets divided up that looks like separate things. But actually, at its very core, it's one. And that has some interesting implications. So that means that there is one truth. It comes out in different ways. It's understood in different ways. But there's actually one basic truth in the universe. There's one energy that actually is enlivening everything from the, rock, from the rocks up to us, to our thoughts, everything. Uh, there's one consciousness that comes through in all organisms and in all people. There's actually one place and one time. It looks like there's lots of times and lots of places, but there really aren't. This particular statement goes back thousands of years, this, this idea of perennial philosophy, especially in the, among the Hindus. Um, but it doesn't surprise us this much, as, as so much, uh, as moderns, because of Einstein, right? We're living in the post-Einstein world. We know that time is weird, and it's not what it looks like it is. But so, uh, science is catching up, maybe, to some of this. But anyway, so one place, one time, and really one organism. I don't know if there's any Carl Sagan fans in here. I grew up, uh, you know, as an 11 or 12-year-old, watching them on PBS, and I just, I just loved them. I mean, I sat in front of the TV and absorbed it. But um, he used to start his shows with something, uh, something like um, the cosmos is all there is, it's all there ever will be, and it's something like that. It's all there is and all there ever will be. In other words, he was talking about the whole, there is whole, one whole thing, and all of the, it's sort of a mystical version of science where everything literally comes from, he would say stardust, but um, everything comes from one place, and we're all in the same place, and it's all happening here. So kind of a perennial idea there. Now, that's the basic ideas of, of the perennial idea, but there's some interesting implications of that. If that is true, then there's some things that must also be true. One of those things is there's no real separation between God and people um, because we're all made of the same thing. Um, you could say we're the organs of God in a way. That also means if there's no separation, real actual fundamental separation between God and people, there's no separation between people and people either, right? So um, it's a very, a very defensible um, way. It's a very, it's a very rock solid way to defend principles such as do unto others as you would have them do unto you, if you understand that they are you in a sense. I mean, you, you're hurting yourself when you hurt another person. If you think you're not, if you think you're not hurting them by, <laughs> you're actually ignorant of what's really going on because you're connected to that person um, and you're affecting your own development by being un unfriendly or unkind to them. Um, there is no time or place is one of the implications. Uh, and really another implication is that all religions start with the attempt to explain the same things. Someone has an experience and then they try to explain that experience to other people who haven't had it and voila, you get religion. Um, as time goes by, um, that religion, uh, it, it gets explained to, to generations, to another generation, and that ex generation explains it to a generation, and it kind of declines in its understanding of what the original experience was. Um, that seems to be kind of what goes on in the world. Anyway, so I know this kind of sounds, this probably sounds kind of Eastern to you, um, or maybe Buddhist, or hippie-ish even. Um, is there any perennialism in Christianity? I mean, we're in a Christian church. We're part of First United Methodist Church. Can we defend any of these ideas, even though we like them, um, in, in Christianity? And I think that's a very good question. I, 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 say, I think we can. I mean, I think they are justifiable. I think that it is. Um, I want to give you some examples. So sometimes, uh, I haven't heard it lately, but for, we often start 11-11 uh, services um, or, or somewhere in the service we have the uh, scripture, God is not far from any of us. I bet you can finish it. <laughs> in him we live and move and are, if you use our current translation. But the King James, in him we live and move and have our being. That's pretty cool. Um, that comes from Acts 17, yeah, Acts 17, 28. Uh, and we are, it's a very interesting concept of God that sounds very Eastern. And of course, Christ, I mean, Jesus was Eastern, right? He wasn't, uh, uh, he wasn't a Westerner. Uh, and this is, of course, this is, I believe, Paul. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so that's when, that one is straight. We use that all the time. It comes straight out of Acts. How about Jesus himself? Or did Jesus say anything that sounds like it would fit into this kind of concept of a perennial truth? 
Well, in the very beginning of the New Testament, I mean, if you open your Bible to Matthew and you flip it open, sorry about that. That helped. If you if you uh, if you flip it open to chapter one, uh, and it's you know it's the beginnings, it's opening up the story for you in Matthew. Um, it, it talks about this prophecy of Jesus from the Old Testament, supposed prophecy of Jesus, and it says he his name shall be called Emmanuel. God is with us. And now this is a quote from the Old Testament. Obviously, his name was not Emmanuel. It was Jesus. So um, that, they did not literally mean, his, when they wrote that, that his name was going to be Jesus. They meant something else. They meant that his role in the scheme of things, in the evolution of things, we might say in a modern, in a modern way of saying it, um, the, it, was to be a symbol of oneness with God. No more was God this distant thing. And if you, if you read the Old Testament, if you've ever had an Old Testament course or you've read the Old Testament, a lot of it is about how separate God is, right? Um, only the priests could go into the Holy of Holies and all those things. You may have, you may have remembered those stories from Sunday school. It was, the separation of God was a big, big deal. You didn't dare. Or if you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know how, how bad it is to reach in there without permission. So anyway, um, one of my favorite movies. I keep, it seems like I bring it up in every sermon. I don't know why. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, God is with us. It's a new, a new version of reality is coming, and it's one where there isn't a separation between God and people. They're coming, we're, the understanding is changing, and Jesus is a symbol of that. God is right here with us. So that's at the very beginning of the New Testament, um, and it shows how the people who wrote at least that testament understood Jesus' significance uh, in, 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 the, in Judaism and then later in Christianity. Um, and of course, another one we use, if you turn over to Luke 17, there's the kingdom of God is within you, is a really interesting passage where Jesus says, it's not something, you know, the kingdom of God is within you. If somebody says, go look here or go look there, it's coming, don't believe them because the kingdom of God is inside you and it's among you all here. Very interesting scripture. Um, another, and, and in other places he implies that what he's saying is, um, we're immersed in it. It's not that you have to look for it. You have to just put away the barriers you already have to it. It's already here. You know, it's not something you have to look for. Again, kind of consistent with that view of, of a different reality being understood, or actually the correct reality being understood uh, more deeply. Um, that's actually the scripture, I believe, right before Jesus walks on water, I think is the next part of that, that, that uh, Luke scripture. Um, I was going to go ahead and invite the band to come up, slowly start coming up. Okay, so that's two examples. The third one, I'm going to call God is people, and it comes from Matthew 22, 37. And this is where, Matthew, where Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And uh, Jesus answers with a very predictable answer at first. It's the Shema. Uh, or it's part of the Shema. It actually has several different parts. Um, here, I think the Shema is actually Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. Um, and then the second part is actually, a, it's said with the Shema, but it's called something else. But uh, anyway, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind. And every Jew would have known that. So that was not surprising that Jesus said that at all. But then Jesus adds something pretty radical, and I think we miss how radical it is because we're so used to hearing it. It's kind of like the Lord's Prayer. I mean, you could say it in your sleep, um, and you don't really think about each of the words and what they mean anymore. But um, anyway, he adds this. The second, the first, that's the first commandment. The second is like it. You must love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's a pretty radical because he's almost equating your neighbor. You want to get close to God? You really want to please God? Then you're going to have to get right with your neighbor. That's where you're going to find God. It's a pretty radical way, break from the way that Jews would have looked at the separation of God. And here Jesus is equating peace with God with peace with people and making it, and of course it became one of the pillars of Christianity, of course. Um, so you must love your neighbor as you love yourself. Um, and then, in case it's not clear, there's one more sentence. All of the law, all of the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. There you go. If you want the answer to what the message of Jesus really is, and you can't figure it out because it's just all over the place, here you go. <laughs> it's summarized, and even in Jesus' own words, 
these are the two commandments you need, to, you need to stick with. Start there, and from there you can understand everything else. Uh, oh, I meant to... F- I, skipped, I forgot to do the slide thing. That's my unity slide. Sorry. I forgot to do my fake clicking. One more, one more click. Okay, this is my God is people slide. Sorry about that. So as it turns out, God is so close you can almost taste it. He really is close. Literally, that is the truth. And because of that, there's every reason for high hopes. So go out there. So go out there and fulfill the prophecy. Amen.